Yeah, please start. Okay, so hello everyone, I'm Gauri and uh, I will be presenting on Safeguard, uh, reducing the security risk from row hammer via low cost integrity protection. So just as an outline, we'll first, um, like we all know, we have gone through what row hammer attacks are. So we'll look at some of the mitigation techniques that are used. And uh, then we'll also look at how those mitigation techniques are broken. Uh, after that, we'll uh, see what safeguard is and how it is designed using the SecDead and Kill chips. And uh, we'll also compare it with other uh, existing solutions and look at some security issues with it. So first we'll look at uh, the mitigation techniques that already exist. So uh, the broad classification, they're broadly classified into four types. In global mitigation, what we do is we increase the refresh rate. So, uh, so less time, uh, like less time to refresh. But uh, if the threshold, like if more number of accesses are happening, then rate it, it, the this like the um, attack still persists and this will be broken. In precise mitigation, what happens is there are two parts to it: that when and where to mitigate. So that depends again on the RS, the row hammer threshold. Uh, and uh, so this is again dependent on uh, row hammer like the threshold and uh, the point of precision mitigation is also that it uh, assumes that only the neighboring uh, like rows can be attacked. So this is one assumption which we'll see was broken. In isolation base, they just again put a guard row between the sensitive and unprotected data. But again, this also assumes that only the next row can be attacked. Uh, in ECC based uh, mitigation, they used another ECC chip which will correct and detect the uh, bit flips, but it only works at low rates. Like if more, more number of bits have been uh, bit flipped or uh, flipped, so then it will again fail to work. So, yeah, we'll just look at how they are mitigated. So, in the first figure, we can see this half double. So as we saw in precise mitigation, one thing was that they uh, assume that only the next row can be or the yeah next row can be uh, attacked. But here, because constantly uh, when they're attacking the uh, like far aggressor, then uh, the near aggressor and the victim, like two rows ahead, we can see that uh, RH bit flips. So then there is no this. Uh, then in the figure two, we can see that the stress pass. So what happens here is that they are uh, arbitrarily simply just uh, like hitting rows as many as possible so that if any mitigation in technique is like tracking key what rows are being hit then it cannot track uh, you know unlimited number of rows so it will create a lot of chaos and then it will be able to attack then is ecc ploy it, it what happens is that it uh, uh, hey, like could you create... pause a bit and then uh, tell us what are these the stress pass ECC plot? What exactly are these techniques? Uh, like they are, uh, they are techniques means they break them. Like they are like breaking the material. Like they are attacking the RAM and then they are able to, uh, uh, you know, bit flip even with the mitigation techniques in existence. So these are different mitigation techniques, is it? No, no, no. These are attack techniques. These are the techniques which break the mitigation. Techniques. OK, OK, taking OK. Not so these are different ways to perform the row hammer attack. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. These are like some of the recent ones that have been there. Then you the must paper. have cited actually. Oh, yeah. Oh, OK. Yes, sir, anyway, anyway. End of on. the paper. Yeah. So, yeah, so these are some of the uh, techniques that break mitigation. Yeah, oh, we'll just look at the evaluation methodology and then we'll move to this. So they have used fault sim for this reliability evaluation and they use RAM emulator for main memory. Uh, of course, this is the four core two level cache and the last level is a four MB shared cache and the main memory is a 16 GB DRAM. Uh, they also assume here that uh, the uh, attacker is not physically present. So that is one. Yes, yeah, so I think we'll move to safeguard. 
so yeah is safeguard as you can see from this hey, diagram that can you uh, uh, can you again pause a bit and tell us like what exactly is the problem that you are planning to present because i'm not clear about the problem itself okay, sir. Uh, uh so actually right now we are just looking at like uh uh access and yeah i'll just explain it here uh so what we are assuming is that we are looking at row hammer mitigation but here we are assuming that if row hammer mitigation fails then uh, what can be done like uh, we are instead of like uh, mitigating row hammer itself we are focusing on detecting whether row hammer has occurred or not so it is not like we are mitigating the row hammer but it's just like we are detecting if the row hammer has gone wrong or not like uh, here what general mitigation techniques uh, are that uh, there is a mitigation technique if it fails then the there will be security threat because there is corrupted data but uh, if we are able to at least detect that mitigate uh, row hammer uh like attack has occurred then we can either detect it or we can tell the system i mean we can either correct it or we can tell that a, a uncorrectable error is there so safeguard is actually uh, focuses on this side uh, right side of the uh, graph where it just uh says that even after row hammer mitigation has failed still i can detect the error and then i can tell the system that okay at least an error has occurred and uh, like we can see what to do after that but it just okay hang sure on so 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 to put it uh, in a precise way the problem that you will be talking about is uh, state of the art mitigation techniques are there but what okay. if they fail yeah we are assuming right now that uh, for example they have failed so then okay. what can be done yeah the, maybe that that you should have put it in the very first slide okay yeah now i'm clear yeah so yeah so yeah so uh, safeguard uh, like focuses on of what happens after the uh, like arrest mitigation has already failed and as they will say for the paper that converts the security threat that there is like we have consumption of corrupted data to a reliability issue like how much can we detect these errors and uh, so yeah so one thing they do is that they use this ecc memories uh, ecc dim which have an extra ecc chips this error correcting code chip that um, yeah that helps in like uh, checking like detecting and also correcting some data so they will just reuse these ecc bits as we will see and uh, yeah the main again is uh, point here is that it detects failures so instead of correcting or getting anything so yeah we will see now how uh, this safeguard was designed with segdet memories so sected are the single uh, error correcting double error detecting memories they have an ecc chip and for uh, each of these uh, 64 bits they have an 8 bit ecc so each line is then uh, has error code either uh, correct one error and detect two errors and here then each bus transfer will go an ecc check like every time you any transfer is there they will go through any ecc check and if it uh, it will correct it if anything is there but if there are more than three errors or more than two errors then it won't be able to even detect anything so that is where we put safeguard into this so one uh, difference you will hear notice is that instead of uh, putting on a 8 bit granular like the line granularity they have completely changes to a 64 byte granularity they uh, argue that like the cache and the memory anyway are you know uh, like are talk to each other on this 64 byte level itself so they for the whole 64 byte data they have uh, created an 10 bit ecc uh, for the whole and a 54 bit mac code for the detection part they for each so for all of this data they will have a 10 bit ecc one and a 54 bit mac code so whenever they are writing any data this uh, the ecc one and the 54 bit mac 
code will be generated and written into this uh, ECC chip. And when reading, then we will first perform the ECC one and then perform a MAC check also. And uh, yeah, if the MAC mismatch is there, then it will simply tell the system that we have detected an error, but we don't know how to correct it. So again, they are here focusing that because of this addition of this 54 bit Mac, they are able to detect all sorts of errors and this ECC one will still be able to correct the uh, single bit errors, not more than that, but single bit errors. But uh, so the issue that comes here is because of the increased granularity. What can happen is uh, so increased granularity can sometimes like have some issues that for example in all if all columns get uh, uh, errors then can like the ecc would have been able to correct it but this cannot so we'll look into that a bit so yeah for example here we can see that in this already segmented memories uh, single bit uh, detection correction everybody can do but safeguard can safeguard can correct uh, sorry, detect all of the errors, even multi-bit errors it is able to detect, but uh, it is not able to correct any multi-bit errors, something which at least SegDet can do. But uh, yeah, it is able to detect all sorts of errors. So one place where it cannot detect is error is, as I had mentioned, that if there is one bit, each bit in a column is wrong. So in the case of the SegDet chips, it would have been possible, but uh, in case of uh, in case of safeguard at the granularity has increased to whole 64 byte, this error it cannot correct. It will be not correct. So to make sure this this much can be corrected, they have extended safeguard to add these parity uh, bit. So each column has an eight bit parity which they will XOR with uh, all the chips, and then finally an eight bit column parity will be generated. And only 46 lower 46 bits of the Mac are retained uh, and it will have an 8 bit column parity. So here what will happen is that they will again do a Mac check and even if the Mac check fails, first they will uh, iteratively like they'll re recover the data by using the column parity and then they will again try to uh, do a Mac check and uh, for like if the one column fails then they'll do it for the other column and so on so they have to iteratively go through all of them but so the thing is that yeah this can be a very slow process like you have to go through so many columns etc but they also argue that the uh, rate of such failure is very low so it won't uh, you know incur a lot of performance issues okay. Yeah, so this is just a reliability con uh, comparison between safeguard and the sectet. So without parity, like the one which were, which could not correct the uh, column errors, we can see that there is a 1.25 times more this difference, 1.25 more more failure rate. But uh, with parity, then they have same correction and rate. But again, here the safeguard will be able to detect more errors than sected, even though it won't be able to correct uh, all of them. Then, uh, yeah, we also look at the performance overhead. So from this graph, we can just see that overall only 0 0.7 per, uh, per uh, slowdown is observed. Uh, this is because to the Mac, due to the Mac checks that have to be done every uh, access. Then there are overheads. Uh, so this there are ECC logic because we have added some uh, extra logic to it. It will require more XOR gates, and uh, memory controller also has to have this compute this Mac, which that 54 bit Mac, which we have to store, and uh, for vertical parity and some SRAM overhead is also there. So these are the overheads for this system. Okay, yeah, so next we'll move to Chipkill. So Chipkill is another security system that is generally used for servers, and it is uh, it works on more of a chip level. So it can tolerate entire chip failures and um, correct also one of the chips if it is wrong. So how it is how it does this is by having uh, symbols like it has 18 memory chips as we can see here. 16 of them have the data 
and uh, they will give out symbols four bits per device so four bit symbols and uh, so this is like a, a symbol based like single symbol correction and double symbol detection type uh, so if, even if there is one symbol is So we'll look at safeguard with chip kill. So here what safeguard uh, does is that it adds this 32 bit parity and Mac instead of the uh, one which used in chip kill. And here we can see that it completely lets go of the uh, symbol system. Like it, it, uh, it's like directly we can see data and the data we have 32 bit Mac and 32 bit parity. So here again, because of the Mac, we can see that there is a stronger detection scheme, like it will be able to detect a lot of errors, but uh, the correction won't be that strong. It will be similar to chip kill because of this parity, 32 bit parity, it will be able to correct something similar to what chip kill can, but uh, it should be able to detect all type of errors. So how it does this is that uh, from this, we can see that first it will try to verify Mac. If it passes then uh, correct then data will be forwarded but if it fails then it starts with the chip id as zero and then it will recover this chip using that parity and after that it will again verify mac and if pass forward data if failed it will increment chip id and do this whole process again until we have exhausted all chips and in which it will tell the system that it has detected an uncorrectable error so yeah so this will match Mac it will trigger a correction and go through each chip and if no Mac has been matched, then it will just give it you. Again, in this we can see that because we have to go through all chips, uh, if we even if a single Mac has failed, then uh, we will see that it has high latency because then you have to do a Mac, then you have to chip ID, then you have to recover also using the parity. So once if even if it fails once, uh, high uh, latency is incurred, but again, they say that it is very rare for that to happen, so it won't affect the performance much. But uh, one thing that happens is if there is a permanent chip failure, so the faulty chip has been detected. For example, you were in the interactive uh, correction scheme, you were able to detect that which chip was faulty, and you will start iterative correction from faulty chip itself so that you don't have to go through all the chips. Uh, again, but there are two issues with it. So first is that the additional Mac check latency will be still be present. You have to do a Mac check, then correct, and then do another Mac check for that. And one thing is that faulty data, whichever the uh, corrupted data is, eventually it will escape the 32 bit Mac. Like if you have many incorrect accesses, like less than a minute, if you have almost millions or billions of accesses which are incorrect, then it will eventually escape the 32 bit Mac detection. So that might be an issue that if permanent chip failure, then quickly we will see that uh, corrupted data has been passed through. So chip kill, so yeah, so for permanent failures, this will fail and it should have been better. So for safeguard, they have another scheme called as eager correction. So in this eager correction, instead of uh, like going through the Mac check and then going through the correction, they'll just simply skip the Mac check and they'll first correct it and then they will uh, see if the Mac has been verified and yes, or else it will again, at the end of it, it has to iterate if it fails. So again, in the failure, failure state, it has to iterate, but uh, they say that um, that much, like we'll have to iterate that much. And if the Mac fails again, there is they will send a uncorrectable error uh, to the system. So here uh, they do this reliability issue, assuming that eager correction is there. And we will see that in the first case where uh, so this FIT rates are the uh, rates of failure rates per billion hours. So if, even if they are increasing the So that of safeguard same reliability we can see but uh, again in this case because of the mac they will be able to detect a lot of uh, what do we say uh, detect a lot of those errors 
and from performance evaluation again we will see that there is an average load on of only 0.7% again because of the mac overhead that is required and they require very less storage storage and logic overhead uh, because they are using the reusing the same chips to perform a uh, store the mac and parity so yeah we'll also compare this with other mac organizations uh, so there are two mac uh, organization this is the intel sgx which uh, data line is protected per line mac and this mac is stored in a separate location so uh, yeah that incurs some uh, like dram overhead and in this synergy style also they have a mac and a parity so the mac will use the ecc chip but the parity is again in a separate location so the latency and overhead related to it are present so because of the latency that uh, it incurs almost 18 point like a lot of slowdown is there compared to only a 0.7% slowdown of safeguard and uh, we prefer safeguard in this cases and yeah because it uses parity and mac bits to store somewhere else in sgx and synergy style so we cannot use the whole uh, memory only safeguard we are able to use the whole memory because it does not uh, it does not use the dram to store these bits uh so here's also sensitivity to mac latency like how much uh, cycles the mac requires to uh, like compute the max so if you, like we can see that even if there are more cycles the safeguard will outperform sgx and synergy even though we'll have more performance overhead the it still outperforms them so we would prefer them yeah so we'll just go to the security discussion uh so some security issues regarding to this safeguard is that uh it cannot correct any of these as like because it is a, only a hardware based solution if many number of bits are flipped in a line then it can it will tell that uh, you know that errors have been detected which are uncorrectable and the software has to do whatever it requires for example shut down the system or something like that but uh, the hardware itself cannot correct it and uh, yeah so because even if you are constantly attacking the system it cannot prevent dos like this denial of service attack uh, there is no way it can detect this but uh, so for vulnerability to replay attack they are they say as we had said that this uh, the the adversary here is the remote like it is does not have physical access to the system so the protection for such attack is not considered and they are impractical so they have just not looked into it but uh, they do say that it is vulnerable to timing attacks like uh, even though like uh, the other chips it can detect these errors even though not correct them if the uh, ecc chip itself is attacked then it won't be able to detect it also so in such cases this ram bleed can be used which uses some form of memory encryption and for the ecc so it would uh, like won't be vulnerable to this timing attacks and the last thing they say is also vulnerability to mac collisions like if the attack is like if there are a lot of attack like attack is corrupting a line every refresh period still it would require 1000 years of attack to for one mac escape so that is why they are saying that uh, a 46 bit mac or a 32 bit mac for Uh, for the case of kill and this for the case of segred is enough for uh, enough strong enough for the system and these values they are assume no preventative action but we always assume that some form of rohammer mitigation is present so then so in conclusion we just say that there is no guaranteed protection against this rohammer attacks and so the safeguard focuses on detecting these uh, bit flips rather than mitigating them and yeah it provides a law, strong detection against any type of failures multi bit on multi row multi bank any type of failures it is able to detect and it uh, the correction strengths they are similar to what we have right now that doesn't decrease and it also avoids all type of storage and performance overheads because it just reuses the existing uh, 
existing chips instead of uh, using DRAM. That's it. Any questions? Uh, so, uh, hi, uh, I have a question. So, yeah. ECC, ECC, and symbols you are storing in another DRAM chips, and which can run into the uh, Ruhamar problem. So, then integrity of ECC and your symbols uh, integrity will might get lost. So, in that case, uh, for like if the ECC chip itself is attacked, then they are saying that they'll use this RAM bleed to protect that. They'll encrypt that memory itself using RAM bleed, and then uh, uh, the ECC chip will be protected. So ECC will be like when you are making memory access, ECC also will be updated, right? So yeah. automatically your ECC, uh, ECC RAM uh, will be accessed, and that particular that RAM also will run into uh, like threshold number of activation. Yeah, and yeah. Some of the bits of the ECC might get corrupted, right? Yeah. No, but they don't actually talk about that. They bit flips off for that. But like, even if it is bit flipped, if we use like memory encryption for the ECC itself, then I think yeah. No, I have to look into this. I'm. Sure. Okay, okay, but, but this this problem will be there, right? I think. Okay, um, I think I'll look into it and get back to you. There was nothing mentioned in the paper actually, but uh, I mean, look into it. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, buddy. Hi. The CC bits are correct, okay. are uh, faulty, then the match check will fail, and if the match yeah. check then you it will pass a DOE and then at least the system won't use the corrupted data. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So my, my question is that how frequent this MAC check happens? Is, is it happening every time a line is read? Reading is happening, it will check the Mac. Sorry, I, I think I lost. Could you please repeat? Hello. Uh, yeah. yeah, hello. Uh, so the Mac will happen every time a line is read. That is there. Every time it will perform that CC and the Mac is read, which is why that performance issues and latency comes because in the critical path only we have an extra Mac check to perform. So now, uh, so now, um... Tell me one thing, there is a upper limit, uh, I mean there is a threshold num threshold value for number of activations for a DRAM row to happen uh, yeah. in a part, in, a, in the, uh, refresh, uh, within the refresh interval so that the row hammer can, uh, can be mounted, right? Uh, is, is it clear what I just said? Yeah. Yeah, so then, yes. um, so, so then uh, because of this delay, uh, are those many uh, activations still possible? Because now every time you are reading a line, you are uh, checking the map also. And it yes. is, so, so how many activations are actually possible? Are those reduced because of this uh, map checking thing? No, 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 it will not. I don't think it affects like how many activations are required. It will, uh, like it will simply, you, no, actually, it won't affect that at all. Sorry. Uh, okay, okay. And, and I have one more one more thing I have. That is, uh, so the, the first question which was asked, uh, the attack can be mounted on the uh, on the chip ECC. which is storing the ECC, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so then every time you are reading a map from there, right? Every time there is a uh, request to read a row, then yeah, yeah. subsequently you are reading a row from, from that chip as well. And given that if it is yes, also from a, the ECC chip. Yes, yes. So it's kind of that you are accessing that row equal number of times, right? 
and so, so th th that might yeah. happen the kind of row hammer right. situation yeah. might happen there as well right Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Yasika, but, like, yeah, paper, not... uh, doesn't suggest that it will completely mitigate the Rohammer attack. Uh, uh -huh. It will just assist other state of the art Rohammer mitigation techniques in uh, like detecting the bit flips, RS bit flips. And it will assist. Yeah, it will be able to detect whether there has been an attack. And it should be installed with the like current state of the art Rohammer mitigation technique. Only. Like it will not work as a standalone technique. Okay, okay, uh, that that I understand. Uh, but uh, my but my point was that only like why uh, ECC chip is yes yes attacked and if that is only went wrong okay. then. Uh, but that yeah. depends on the kind of structure ECC chip will have. If it is exactly the same that of DRAM, then it's easier, yeah. right? The bits can yes, be flipped. Yes. That is, yeah. but, but I got your point, Govind. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's move on in the interest of time. Thank you, everyone. Is my screen visible? Yes. Can I start the presentation? But I can't hear you properly. Hello, am I audible now? Yes, it's much better. OK. Yeah, if your uh, internet bandwidth is high, you may turn on your camera also. OK. Yes, perfect. Okay, um, can I start? Sure. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I'm representing Team Codem. Today, I will be presenting the paper Cache FX, a framework for evaluating cache security. The outline of the presentation is as follows. First, we will see the problem statement, then the reason for solving it, and next, we will see the details and of the solution provided by the others, Cache FX, and the results of it. Lastly, we will see where cache effects can still be improved. So the problem. The problem we want to solve is based on security. Uh, basically, we want to evaluate the security that the cache designs offer against contention based cache attacks. So why do we need to solve this problem? The reason is, let's say a vendor wants to choose a cache design for his processor that will help him uh, stop the cache side, chan uh, side channel attacks basically try to reduce the side channel attacks. So then he will have so many options because there were so many works that tried to curb the side channels. So hence we need some sort of metric to rank these designs so that we can choose one. So is this the first attempt to solve this problem? No, several metrics have been suggested to perform such evaluations, but they tend to be limited in the uh, potential adversaries they consider or their applicability to the real world scenarios. Moreover, all of them implicitly assume a single metric is sufficient to encompass the nuances of all the side channel security, which is not the case, is what is observed by the others. Now I'll give a 10k feed view of each cache design that is used uh, for evaluation so that we can understand the results. So before that, one point that we need to note is many of the uh, side channel based attacks uh, have this property of evicting a particular victim cache line. So how is this achieved? He is using this eviction set. It's it's a basically a set of addresses. When if we access those, we have a, uh, we hope that that particular victim cache line is evicted. So this eviction set is a construction is common for attackers. We will use this later. Okay, now let's move on to the caches. Uh, so there are a total of nine caches that are implemented by others. If we want, if we have a new cache design and we want to use cache effects to evaluate that cache, we can add that cache easily. It's not that difficult. But currently, nine different cache designs are implemented. A fully associative and set associative caches are basic caches that we all know. Next, way partition caches. Uh, we will force the 
different security domains to use a different subset of ways of cache ways uh, so that um, there is no leakage between the attacker and victim. Similarly, in partition lock, uh, partition lock caches, the whole cache is shared by all the security domains, but there is an option to uh, pin the uh, cache line. So if if the cache line is pinned, uh, no other security domain can evict this particular cache line. So in that way, it will prevent the leakage, data leakage. Caesar, uh, I think we already had a presentation on Caesar S. So basically, Caesar is a, a developed based on a citation to cache, and instead of direct uh, mapping from some bits of the address to the set, we will use some encryption based randomization randomized mapping from addresses to the cache set in Caesar. In Caesar S, we split the part uh, the whole uh, set into different partitions along the ways. And for each of these partitions, we will use a different key for this uh, address to set mapping. Basically, more randomization. If this number of partitions along this ways is one, then it's Caesar. If the number of partitions is equal to the number of ways, then it is scatter cache. Next, phantom cache is also built upon the set associated to cache. And it maps each address to multiple uh, sets using multiple hash function, hash function. So for a cache hit, we need to uh, search in, in multiple sets. And similarly, if a, uh, if there was a cache miss, then we can randomly select any one of these sets and uh, put, the, put, put the cache line there. So finally, new cache. A new cache is more efficient implementation of fully associated cache. Instead of comparing the whole tag with the entire cache line, it compares an index bit, uh, index uh, uh, which is uh, slightly lesser compared to the whole tag. Uh, to the whole cache line, and then if the index bit hits, then it will compare the tag. Uh, so if the index bit is small, then we will significantly reduce the power and implementation cost of the fully associated cache. If the index bit is larger, then it will approach the fully associated cache. Uh, now let's see the solution proposed by the others. Cache FX. Cache FX is basically a framework that allows various combinations of victims, cache designs, and attack strategies, and we can evaluate uh, on any given um, combination. So it is basically divided into three major components. The attack model, this is basically an interface for us to model any attack uh, strategy, as well as the security evaluation strategies. Memory handler acts as, uh, basically translates the memory read, write, or invalidate request from the attack model to the cache model and hit or miss information from the cache model to the attack model. The cache model is again an interface uh, which allows us for uh, various cache implementations. So that's it. This is basically the cache design, uh, cache FX design, which allows us to use different attack models and cache models and um, security evaluation strategies to and uh, get some metrics. So, uh, that's it. This is the solution proposed. But to show that this cache FX is indeed useful, others also implement uh, three different security metrics and on nine different cache designs, the cache designs that are shown in the previous slide, and um, shows the working of this um, cache FX. The first metric that they propose is relative eviction entropy, REE. REE basically measures the amount of information that an attacker can deduce from a single victim access. For this, we start from the intuition that a fully associated cache with random replacement policy will leak the least amount of information among the non-partition cache. This is because every address is equally likely to be uh, getting evicted uh, when a victim has access and it, there is a miss in the victim. Every address in the cache is equally likely to be evicted. And there is very less information that is being uh, given um, on the victim. So we take this pro pro uh, PU of A denotes the probability of eviction of a particular uh, address in address in the cache under this uh, uh, random replacement policy and fully associated cache, which is basically one by n if the cache has total of n line. So we use this as a reference, and we will calculate the statistical difference between this between this. Uh, fully associated to random replacement and the te current test design. PE of A denotes the probability of eviction of address uh, of the current test design. 
So this is all. Uh, these all probabilities are measured when a fixed victim address is being accessed. So the statistical distance we are using is the KL divergence here. Okay. Uh, to sample this PE of A, we simply count the number of evictions for the attacker cache lines. Uh, well, the re victim repeatedly access a fixed uh, cache line. And we finally divide by the total number of uh, observed evictions to get this PE of A. This is the picture showing RE for different cache design. And we can easily see that the partition caches uh, does not leak any information. So they exhibit zero leakage. For CSRS and set associated caches, the information leakage will be equal to log of number of sets. The reason for this is easily observed if if you see this equation of KL divergence, P U of A will be equal to one by N, whereas P U of A will be equal to one by the elements in a particular uh, elements in the set corresponding to that victim address. Hence, we will have N by number of elements in the set that will give to the number of sets and the summation outside will sum to one. So we will have a number of sets for both Caesar and the set associated cache. And Caesar S, uh, phantom cache and scatter cache uh, Im slightly improve upon those two uh, because of the randomization they introduce. And if you look at the fully associated cache and new cache, both of them ideally should have zero leakage because we are referencing with them with their probability distribution. But due to the statistical noise, we will have some slightly non-zero information leakage. Now the figure three uh, shows the RE for different CSRS configurations, that is different number of ways and different partition counts. You can clearly see that as the number of partitions increases or the number of ways increases, the information leakage decreases. So this completes the first metric. So we can take any questions before moving on to the second metric. Okay, moving on. Okay, I, I have a question. So could you maybe pause a bit and uh, give me some pointers like why this is a good metric to start with this RE? Yes, sir. so uh, so we are uh, measuring the information leakage due to a single victim access. So it's basically a theoretical measurement uh, of the we are giving an upper bound on the leakage possible by a single measurement. So even the past works used a similar kind of things uh, for measuring the leakage. So then what's the difference? Yes, sir. so for this metric, there is no difference, much difference compared to the previous things. Uh, but for uh, calculating this metric, we need very, very strong attacker, very unrealistic attacker. So we need the count of how many addresses, uh, sorry, how many times a particular address being evicted. So this is only possible because cache effects has a property that when a victim access causes an eviction, this cache model will return that evicted address back to the attack model. So using this, it is able to count this. So there are similar measurements in the previous works, um, but this is more. Uh, what is more stronger than that, but stronger in terms of what? Like you need to defend it, right? So stronger meaning. So like we are giving an uh, upper bound. So we cannot uh, a, uh, a single victim access cannot get any more information than this. So okay. that's for sure. So the next two metrics are not theoretical based. So they are somewhat real world attack based. Okay, yeah, move on. Okay, uh, the second metric is called the eviction set creation. We already noted that building eviction set is common to many cash, uh, side channel based cache attacks. So we want to measure how difficult is it to build an eviction set in the cache design for a given cache design. So for building eviction sets, uh, the authors consider three eviction set building algorithms. Single holdout method and group elimination method. 
So these two are top-down approaches. They will start with a long set of attacker addresses that will evict a particular victim address, and they will string them, uh, string them uh, sequentially. Like they remove uh, addresses and verify if the cache config still remains, and so on. So in SHM, they will remove one address at a time. In GEM, they remove a group addresses at a group of addresses at a time and see if the config still remains. The third method is prime, prune, and probe. Uh, it's a bottom-up approach. It prefills the cache with the candidate addresses and triggers the victim access and tests the misses in the candidate set. If there is a miss in the candidate set, then that particular address is set into the eviction set. So thereby locating a conflict set. So now we have three different uh, eviction set building algorithms and we have nine different cache designs. So CacheFX allows us to evaluate these using three methods. The first is the number of uh, total memory accesses needed for building this eviction set. Second is the percentage of the addresses in the eviction set that actually conflict with the victim address space. Third, if we use this eviction set, what is the rate of successful eviction? So to measure these values, we average over some thousand times. We perform this eviction set building thousand times and we average over these values. This is the results. Like there's a number of memory accesses uh, using the three algorithms, PPP, GEM, and SHM for uh, all the non-partition cache design. So we can see that uh, the number of memory accesses required are the highest for SHM and are all, all of equal order for all the different caches. But if you see for PPP, it is small for all uh, caches based on the set associated, whereas it is slightly higher for the caches based on this uh, fully associated caches because in those fully associated cache, uh, caches, we will need a larger eviction set and larger eviction set will need, um, because we start from an empty set and then improve, we go from a bottom-up approach in PPP, we will need a larger number of memory accesses. Whereas a GEM, uh, uh, most, in most cases it remains in between PPP and SHM, but uh, where the cases of large eviction sets, it performs better. This is also the number of memory accesses uh, in CSRS. Is there a question? Uh, yeah, uh, hi, I have a question. In the previous slide, uh, yeah. what is happening with new cache? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so new cache is also based on fully associated to cache, right? So it will also need a larger eviction set. Uh, I mean, uh, why PPP has more accesses and uh, GEM has less? I, I mean, I, it's just a clarification question. If I, I don't know why it is happening. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, so if you see uh, in uh, G, uh, PPP and SHM, we are adding addresses one, one by one. Uh, in SHM, we are removing addresses one by one. Whereas in GEM, we are removing addresses as a group. And since the eviction set is very large, uh, uh, so removing addresses actually, as a group uh, my, is faster. My confusion yeah. is uh, in comparison to PP and GEM. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as it, for SHM, I get it that it has maximum uh, number of addresses needed. But for uh, PPP and GEM, so uh, is it because that new cache will have uh, 16 ways, all the ways, and it need to fill it up, right? Is that the reason? But why it is? No, uh, new cache also has a single a single way. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, basically, like PPP needs to build up from bottom up. So it starts with empty set and it starts adding elements from the conflict set one by one. So this takes time, right? Mm, okay. I mean, so like okay. if the eviction set is smaller, then it does, it completes very faster. Like all the Caesar case, Caesar, if you see, it completes very fast because the eviction set here is very small. Whereas the eviction set here in new cache is larger, so it takes more time to build it. Okay. Okay, yeah, thanks. Please move on. So here as well, so we are moving. Uh, for, this is also the number of memory accesses required for the uh, 
as we said building algorithms uh, but we fixed the cache design csrs and we changed the number of cache lines and as we increase the cache lines the eviction set also increases and as as the eviction set size increases the time taken for eviction set building uh, algorithms also increases which is observed here now this figure shows the number of addresses that found in the eviction set that actually truly conflict with the victim addresses now if you see this purple color the ppp 100% uh, of the addresses given by this algorithm are already conflict with the victim addresses but this ghm uh, and sem does not perform that well especially in the skewed caches like csrs and scatter cache this shows the eviction set sizes uh, that are given by these algorithms so as you see that the for the fully associative and the new cache the eviction set size is higher so that's why the ppp takes a little bit more time to get that eviction set and if you also see uh, for other cases like caesar caesar s phantom and scatter cache and set associative cache uh the gem and shm uh, converges before reaching this minimal size the, if the minimum since the ppp is getting a 16 size whereas these sizes are much higher compared to that now this figure shows the success of eviction rate the third metric that we want to use the eviction success rate for a given eviction set and if you see for the fully associative cache the caesar the new cache and the set associative cache all the three algorithms perform equally well but for caesar s this ppp method does very well uh, and in scatter cache as well the ppp uh, performs better but the eviction success rates are very low for these caches but if you look at the phantom cache the order is reversed the ppp doesn't perform well whereas the gem and shm perform well the reason is the eviction set sizes that are given by this algorithms are order sir so of course there is high, uh, there is higher likely to evict the victim so uh, can we improve this 4% 2% to a higher percentage of eviction success rate yes we can uh, so we basically keep on adding the conflict addresses and until we reach that uh, eviction success rate but this will reduce the performance of the attack so this figure shows the sizes of uh, eviction set sizes required for 90% eviction size so uh, we have seen two metrics we have one more to go if we have any questions we can take okay moving on so as i said before uh, the first metric uses a completely unrealistic attacker to get that hey uh, so sorry uh, j- just a uh, clarification so this paper shows that all these randomized caches are not secure then yes sir so that that's the single line uh, take away right sir uh, basically this paper has provides as a framework which we can use to evaluate different cases yeah that, that i got it that's the utility of the paper but in terms of insights insight uh, yes sir. right okay yes sir so this third metric uh, is named cryptographic attacks we use a completely real world scenarios to measure the security offered by this emerging cache design uh, when we perform attacks on cryptographic implementation so for this the authors stimulate two victims uh, which uses cryptographic algorithms while the attacker tries to distinguish between the two keys used by the victims basically the victims use two different keys uh, to for their cryptographic encryptions and based on the two keys they uh, they perform differently and based on their uh, based on these differences the attacker tries to distinguish between these two keys the first one is as victim it basically differs in how many cache lines it accesses uh, between the two keys in modular exponential an exponentiation victim so it basically differs in whether a multiplication operation is done or not between the two keys 
So the attacker basically observes the cache misses, the average number of cache misses of the two keys, and sees if um, if it can confidently differentiate between the two keys. Uh, so the others use two different types of attacks. The first one is an eviction-based attack. So where the attacker is given an eviction set with 90% success rate, eviction success rate. So the attacker proceeds in rounds. So in each round, the attacker primes the cache using the eviction set. The victim does an encryption round with a given key by the attacker. And after that, the attacker again access the eviction set to get the cache meshes. And it will keep this count of this cache meshes for this particular key. And will he repeats these rounds and uh, calculate the average um, cache misses for each key, and it will stop when it, they reach the 95% confidence that uh, these two averages differ. So these are the results of the eviction set attack and the number of encryptions needed to gain that 95% confidence. And all these, the number of encryptions are normalized using this fully associative uh, cache design. So if you see this Caesar with eight way, eight ways, um, sorry, eight partitions, uh, has a significantly higher protection than any other cache design for this eviction set attack. And uh, we can see that the new cache, phantom cache, uh, are provide equal, almost equal uh, protection as the fully associated to cache. And the scatter cache performs well where for the four ways and eight ways. And in other cases, it doesn't really perform well. And set associated and doesn't perform well as expected. So I have a query here. So for CGRS, uh, yes, if the y axis is more than 1.4, that means it takes, uh, you know, 40% additional time for the attack attacker to successfully mount the attack, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So it, it just delays the time it takes for an attacker to complete the attack, but still it's not secure per se as per the definition, right? So, yes, sir. Okay. So it's just Secure. affecting the agility of the attacker. Right. right. So, right. Okay. The next figure shows an occupancy attack. So this is a slightly different than the eviction set based attack. So here we do not give any eviction set to the attacker. And here the attacker does not only observe this particular eviction set misses in the eviction set, it observes the whole cache. So the attacker uses a cache size buffer and counts the number of misses when scanning this buffer. So it's basically observing the victim's overall cache usage. The rest of the process remains same. And like um, uh, running it multiple times using each key and calculating the average number of cache misses. And this is the number of encryptions needed to gain that 95% confidence using this occupancy attack. And here, like almost all the uh, cache designs perform similar, uh, give similar security as the fully associated cache, which is better than the set associated cache. Now, this figure shows this um, number of encryptions needed uh, for the same um, AES attacks, um, but for different re replacement policies. So previously, all the cache designs used the random replacement policies, but now uh, we are using a total of four replacement policies, the re recently used, um, two pseudo uh, recent, uh, least recently used algorithms and the random replacement policies, and we are comparing the, uh, the results. So if you see the Caesar and all, uh, the random replacement policy does better than this deterministic policies even in the set associated cache for the most cases, except this bit PLRU, uh, I will talk about that. But in most of the cases like Caesar associative and set associative, um, the random policies perform better than this deterministic policies. But if you see the phantom cache, even in the deterministic uh, replacement policies, it does better, much better than the other cache design. This is because it is inherently non-deterministic. So, because uh, 
every address is mapped to different sets and we don't know which set it uh, in between these multiple sets we don't know in which set the cache line exactly exists so we need to search in all the multiple sets so due to this inherent non determinism um, the number of encryptions needed for phantom cache even though we use deterministic replacement policies is higher now if you see in some cases this bit pseudo lru uh, has higher number of encryptions than uh, the random replacement policy this is actually an anomaly um, uh, it says that the paper says that um, due to some corner cases this bit plru uh, requires higher encryptions to meet that 95% uh, what is confidence so due to that we are having this higher uh, bit plru but but uh, the random policy is the best, best policy to provide the security so in conclusion we show that cache cache fx is a flexible framework that supports multiple metrics of evaluation cache designs and we have seen the usage by implementing three metrics so where does this fall short first uh, there is no support of evaluation of cache hierarchies hence the design that rely on this hierarchies for defense for defense are out of the scope of this work second there is no insight on the performance of the cache design like we want to assess the trade off between this performance and the security but that is not supported right now and it assumes a noise free scenario the metric that the third metric that we see it assumes a noise free scenario but this is not necessarily negative because it gives us a conservative uh, estimate of the security because noise free scenario is the best case for the attacker but still we might want to see the impact of the noise on the security so it also does not support cross core eviction based attacks uh, using uh, that use the inclusion principles of llc hey, hang on go back to the last point yes sir what do you mean by doesn't support cross core eviction based attacks sir That's uh, what you have been explaining right from last half an hour sir we are uh, we are explaining this eviction set based attacks right uh -huh. so the uh, but the cross core evictions that uses this inclusion properties of llcs those are okay, not okay that, that is anyway part of the first point right no support on evaluation of cache uh, right, sir, right sir right sir so what about the uh, flash based sir, attacks sir what about uh, the sorry flash based attacks but, uh, uh in the first point actually uh, the negative is for talking about is that the cache hierarchies uh, some of the cache hierarchies rely on that hierarchy to provide the security so those are not actually supported this only simulates uh, one of the uh, hierarchy uh, one of the level of the hierarchy either l1 l2 or l3 okay okay uh Yeah. So, what about flush-based attacks? Do they talk about flush-based attacks? Like how secure <coughs> all these proposals are? Uh, sir, can I explain it? Yeah. Flush-based attacks. Uh, sir. Uh, no, sir. The three metrics they perform doesn't talk about the flush-based attacks. But I think the framework they uh, gave i think we can implement a security measure, uh, measurement like we should implement as a that measuring the the paper itself doesn't talk about the flash based attack no but i don't think this model will be useful for flash based attacks right because you don't need eviction based entropy you don't need to create eviction set for flash based attack it's just the cl flash instruction yes sir even the occupancy based attacks doesn't needed this eviction set right we still were able to use this framework occupancy it still needs because the occupancy is affected based on the evictions right right, right sir. but but in cl flush there is no notion of eviction right right sir right sir. okay uh, any other sir. questions sir uh, in uh, actually flush case attack they had said that uh, we can uh, prevent those by separating the Memory bound for both fixing and attacking. So they are ignoring it. So that is a pretty sweeping statement, right? Yeah. 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 
in that case you can you can uh, you know mitigate all kinds of attacks saying that okay you know this is just temporarily or spatially partition all uh, processes then no need to even evaluate the eviction based attack that was a rather strong assumption on their part yeah it's a strong assumption but which is actually a weak assumption uh, yeah <laughs> okay others any questions okay then well, let's move on to the last presentation yeah overall it was good thank you sir Uh, is my screen visible, sir? Yes. So you are back on track. No fever, nothing. Yes, sir. I'm fine. Okay, cool. Uh, so, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Prajit Des from Team Spectre Down. Uh, so I'm going to present the paper: filter caching for free, the untapped potential of the store buffer. So the plan uh, is going to be uh, the following: uh, an introduction to store queue and store buffer, and uh, we look at the scope of uh, scope for improvement in the current design. Uh, then we look at store buffer cache, uh, new uh, storage structure introduced by the uh, paper, and then look at uh, discuss the coherence and synonyms in uh, that context. And we look at some results. Uh, so first, uh, store queue. Uh, store queue is a data uh, storage structure which allows ordering of stores, uh, which helps to uh, reduce the latency in case of write misses. So this is widely used in the total store order memory model. So the purpose, it serves two purposes. One uh, is going to be in order store commit, where uh, it allows the stores to commit in the order they arrive. And uh, it also helps when there is a load after a store, when the load uh, wants to access some value, which is in the store queue buffer. So it allows for uh, coherent values. Uh, it allows to access coherent values. Uh, then we look at store buffer. Uh, so the entries in the store queue are not committed. So once they get committed, uh, to avoid stalls uh, due to write uh, before writing back to the L1 cache, we can store it in another structure called store buffer. So this allows to reduce uh, the latency caused by those stalls. Uh, in practice, the store queue and the store buffer are implemented in the uh, implemented uh, together in a circular FIFO queue. So moving from uh, one data structure to another, this is just simply moving a pointer. Uh, so now uh, in the current design, uh, the authors... Okay, can you uh, pause in the previous slide? Yes. So why you need to stall at the commit? Uh, it's not stalls. Uh, so after committing, we can uh, we have need to write back to the L1 cache, right? Uh -huh. So if, the, uh, if there is some stalls in that period, we can store it in the store buffer. And then uh, once it's free, we can write back to the L1 cache. OK, but but it says stalls at the store queue during commit. Uh, the first when, point, stalls at SQ during commit. Yeah, uh, like when you reach the head of store queue, that is when you should you will start writing to the L1 cache instead of just waiting to finish right and then start writing the next one. Uh, that will let us lose the out of order benefits we get, right? So you just push it to store buffer. Ah, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, move on, move on. Yeah. So uh, in the current design, uh, the authors. Uh, I think he got disconnected. Um, I think so. I'm just calling him regarding this. this is... Hello. 
Yes. Sir, uh, the LAN got down, so I, I got so, disconnected. Yes, it's okay. Continue. Yeah. So, uh, so there is very low utilization of the store queue store buffer. This is due to two reasons. One of them is because of small size, uh, because the store queue store buffer is only 56 entries, and uh, it follows an aggressive eviction policy that once the entry is written back to the L1 cache, it is removed from the store buffer. So, uh, and they also. Uh, the, and they also differentiate between the standard design and an optimal store queue store buffer, uh, where this optimal means that uh, the writing back uh, to the L1 cache is delayed until necessary, until uh, there is a space requirement in the store queue buffer or store buffer. So uh, we can see that the optimal SQ has a much higher. Yes, no, sorry, I didn't get it. Uh, could you spell out again the optimal one? Uh, so, so in the standard one, uh, when we write back to the L1 cache, we remove it from the store buffer, mm -hmm. but in the optimal one. Uh, unless there is a storage requirement, uh, if the unless the store queue store is constrained, yeah, okay, uh, we don't write back. Only when space is required, then we write back and remove it from the SQS. Okay, okay, uh, got it. Prajit, Prajit, sorry, I, I have a query. Are these store buffers private to each core or they are common? They are private. If they are private, suppose I need this, uh, I need this particular cache block. Uh, means there is a read request from another core. So yeah. how would you classify it in the optimal store buffer store queue structure? I have a request from an another uh, core, but uh, here I still have a lot of space, so I don't need to no, write it uh, in another case. This, uh, this experiment is for spec 2006 benchmarks, which is all uh, single core programs. No, okay. that's okay. That's okay. But what Varun is asking is what will happen? If you run multi-threaded parallel applications, there will be coherency issues. So they have described that later around the paper. How do they handle it? Okay. But 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 this coherency issues can be easily handled. Uh, I I think the store queue store buffer is also part of the coherence domain, right? Yeah, like the the optimal one is not uh, handled that way. Okay. Like if if you delay the writing, the then has uh, uh, coherence uh, uh, properties, but this optimal one doesn't have. Okay. Okay. Uh. So we see that uh, the current design has a low hit ratio. So this means that even though it provides low latency and low energy uh, benefits, we are not able to access it because of this low hit ratio. So uh, and uh, and we uh, we also see that uh, a lot of uh, if there is a lot of store queue store buffer hits, then we can avoid probing the L1 cache. So using this and also uh, let us look at filter cache. So filter cache is a very small cache between the CPU and the L1 cache. Uh, it provides very low latency and power, uh, but due to its very small size, it's smaller than L1 cache. Uh, it has a very low hit rate, uh, so there are a lot of evictions and writes on load, which leads to bad performance. So now uh, let us look at the uh, similarities between the store queue store buffer and the filter cache. So we see that uh, all the stores, all the store requests go through SQSB. It also goes through L0 cache the, or the filter cache, and uh, every time there is a load. The uh, store queue store buffer is probed uh, to check for uh, any new writes, and uh, similarly, uh, the filter cache is also probed because uh, from the core it has to go through filter cache and then uh, to L1, L2, and so on. So we see that the store queue store buffer is already paying the costs of a filter cache, uh, with, uh, already paying the uh, costs without having to introduce uh, new hardware or software. So. So this, uh, so with this, we can we see that we can use store queue store buffer as a filter cache. Uh, so you can see in this diagram, we see the number of uh, L1 TLB access uh, filtered, filtered out as uh, filtered out by the store queue store buffer. Uh, so now, uh, one more hey, thing Praj in the current. Prajit, I, I think I uh, missed it. So what do you mean by filtered here? Filtered in the sense uh, we get a hit in the store queue store buffer without going need to needing to go to L1 TLB. Oh, okay, okay. Similar to suppose we have L L0. If we hit in L0, we don't go to L1. So okay. similarly, we, if we hit in SQSB, we don't need to go to L1 to get back to L1. This is basically the hit rate at the store queue store buffer. The plot that you are showing. Yes. Sir. Yes. But this number is really, really low, right? Uh. In the uh, in the in L zero cache, uh, it, this is I think similar to the filter cache. So, okay, that's what they are trying to achieve. This. Okay. Uh, 
Pradeep, a small query. Uh, is the store is store queue store buffer uh, a set associative cache or is it, it is just a you like this? just 56 uh, entry? Uh, I mean, uh, the filter cache is actually uh, the paper says that it's a small, it's very small size with uh, high associativity, but the store queue store buffer is just a set of entries. Uh, there is no associativity. I think. No, 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 no. Why I am think, uh, saying this is because now just you said that you are able to filter out so many L1 and TLB accesses, right? Uh, yeah. Why don't we just implement uh, a VIVT L1 cache straight away? VIVT L1 cache doesn't require a TLB access point one and point two. If you directly rather than using a store buffer, if you directly write into the VIVT L1 cache and keep its associativity high, then that should work, right? I'm just trying to understand whether there is, is there any difference between what I am telling and what they are doing. Uh, what they are doing is there is already a store queue store buffer which because they are evicting entries from the store buffer once it's returned. They are saying that instead of evicting it immediately, we use yeah. that unto space. So as to create how much benefit we can gain from that. They are not adding something else but they are uh, taking some unexplored potential from within the existing store queue store buffers. Okay, okay. No, no, no. My, my thing was why don't we eliminate store buffer straight away from the picture and directly go to the cache? Uh, we need in order writing to the store, into the cache, right? So that's yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, you need to start once every time. Okay. Maybe we can discuss it later. Maybe yeah, you go ahead with the presentation. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so, uh, and uh, in the current design, uh, for probing, uh, for uh, when a request comes, uh, th there is a simultaneous probing of the store queue store buffer and the L1 DLB access. So if there is a hit in SQ uh, store queue store buffer, then the DLB access is uh, left out. Uh, otherwise, uh, it goes through that and gets the required value. So, so here we would like to uh, uh, using the uh, hit rates we just saw. We would like to uh, achieve the following. If we get a hit rate in SQSB, uh, we don't even go to the L1 DLB. Uh, so that is what we are trying to achieve. Uh, but there is one problem with this. If the if we don't correctly predict that there, is, there will be a hit in SQSB, then this will cause a very high latency because we let a miss in the store queue buffer. Then we have to go to the L1 DLB and get the values. So this is even more latency than the original design. So. This requires an accurate prediction of whether we'll get a hit or miss in the store queue store buffer. So, uh, so eventually we need to retain as much data as possible in the in this uh, storage, so, such that uh, we get hits in the store queue store buffer until there is a storage requirement. So, this is achieved by the store buffer cache. It's just a lot logical partition of the already existing uh, FIFO queue. Uh, so. Already there is a storage uh, store queue store buffer which is implemented. The free space in that is, is known as the store queue uh, store buffer cache. So the combined three uh, the three uh, these three structures combine to form the store buffer uh, SQBC, which is the store queue buffer cache. So once the entry from the store buffer is written to L1, it it is moved from the store buffer to the store buffer cache. And uh, moving between these three data structures is very easy. As we just need to move some pointers uh, from one uh, from one entry to another, uh, so this provides a high hit rate uh, because as we are returning the entries in the store uh, store queue buffer cache, uh, loads that come uh, uh, have a hit in the SQLP, therefore avoiding uh, a need for probing the L1 TLB cache. Uh, so here uh, we need to discuss two things uh, that is synonyms and uh, coherence issues. Uh, so for synonyms, uh, we need to translate, we need to make a translation from the virtual address to physical address to avoid uh, clashing into the same physical address. Uh, so for this, the solution is that the store queue buffer cache data structure already holds both the virtual address and physical address. So, uh, so when we get a hit in that, we just take the corresponding physical address and uh, move, uh, write to that. Uh, if there is no physical address, then we don't require an extra TLB access. This is because uh, this is because anyways we are going to uh, probe the L1. Uh, go, uh, anyways we are going to go to the L1 and then probe a TLB access. So for now we don't need to do any TLB access. So next we have some coherence issues. Uh, this can be caused uh, in a multi-core environment where uh, 
uh, in a in a co in a particular core the spc is having a particular value uh, but some other core can modify that value and uh, we may not know about that so to deal with this we we need to have some uh, approaches uh, so for this uh, discussion we will uh, assume there is a macy protocol which stands for modified exclusive shared and invalid uh, state states protocol uh, so using this let, let us look at some approaches so the first uh, so that uh, we can propose two naive solutions so one of them is you for uh, any cache invalidation is forwarded to this sqb3 data structure and uh, the corresponding entries in the store buffer cache are flushed out or we can do go to the other extreme where for any invalidation or for any downgrade from the modified to any other states we flush all the entries of sbc thereby losing all the benefits that we wanted to gain so but this is obviously uh, very bad we don't want to flush the whole sbc and we want to retain uh, as many entries as possible so for this uh, we look at a slightly better optimization where we perform a flush bulk flush of the store buffer cache only on the following conditions uh, so when the state moves goes from modified to an invalidated or a modified to shared uh, this means that we cannot track the uh, we cannot track what happens to that da data hereafter this is because modified represents an exclusive ownership over that data but if it goes to a shared or invalidated state then any other core can modify them and hence we cannot know what happens to that uh, after this so in those cases we can flush out all the data from sbc or if there is a eviction of cache line which is an em state in, in even in that case uh, the same thing holds and hence we can uh, flush all the entries from sbc uh, although this is better than the previous two approaches this is still not very good this is because uh, a line or cache line has more life than an sbc entry because sbc entry is just 56 entries whereas a cache line uh, whereas a cache is a lot bigger than the sbc so a line stays in a cache for much more time than sbc so uh, so when a when a cache line goes from uh, m state to uh, s state for, for uh, suppose uh, that entry might have left the sbc long ago because uh, sbc is short and the life uh, of a sbc entry is very small so it might have left the SPC long ago, but uh, according to a previous protocol, we will still flush it, flush all the entries from SPC. So this is a waste of uh, flushing and uh, we lose the benefits that we wanted to acquire. So in order to avoid this, we use some con we use a concept called EPOSH or we use a concept, uh, use some notion of oldness of the entry in the cache line. So for this, we use something called multicolored dirty bits. Uh, so uh, let us explain. Uh, I, I explain this here. Uh, so this is the structure, which is SQ, SB, and SBC. Uh, this is uh, the violet color denotes SQ, blue denotes SB, and black denotes SBC. So we are uh, giving some colors to the SBC. Uh, so currently, the color of SBC is black. Uh, so uh, if the color color is black, then we call it a black epoch. So uh, when we write from this SBC to the uh, L1 cache. We also uh, denote that using an extra bit per, per each line to denote if it is black or whatever color it is. So uh, in this case, when we write from this uh, SBC to the cache, we write it using uh, with the black bit set. Uh, so uh, this approach, uh, in this approach, if there is an invalidation or a downgrade of cache line which is not black in color, then we don't do anything to the SBC. Uh, so here, as you can see, uh, we are invalidating some lines which are not black in color. So uh, we do no uh, we do nothing to the SBC. We just remain as it is. Once the, we encounter an invalidation or a downgrade to a black cache line, then we flush all the SBC entries. And now we change the color to red. So in this case, uh, this black line is invalidated. So we move to a red epoch. And now, uh, and now, uh, whenever the entry is written to the L1 cache, the color, uh, the set color will be uh, the red bit will be set. So, uh, so the uh, so whenever we write to the L1 cache, it will be uh, of red color. Again, uh, since uh, the SPC is now in red epoch, any uh, any invalidation of a black color or any other color uh, apart from red doesn't matter. We stay as it is. If there is an invalidation of a red line, then we uh, 
flush out all the entries of SPC. So, I, so what this provides is that, uh, so this provides two layers of uh, uh, two layers of oldness of a uh, entry. So, suppose the current epoch is red, the previous epoch is black, the pre uh, the pre one previous to that will be red, and so on. So, uh, when we are sub when we are flushing out entries. We are not flushing the whole. In, uh, we are not flushing the uh, all the entries, but instead only a part of the entries which are having the same color. So uh, when we are using uh, two colors, we might flush a bit less. But as we increase the number of colors and the number of epochs, there will be a lot more. Uh, uh, there will be a lot more colors, and hence the number of uh, entries that we we are going to flush will be very less. Because uh, suppose we are in color one, uh, color one now. So previously would have been in color n. Then n my uh, previously n minus one and so on. So the number of uh, entries which have color one out of all these colors will be very less, uh, very less compared to the two color case. So uh, here, so here is a generalization. Uh, Could so, you go back to the previous slide? Yes. So, so what is the granularity here when you talk about uh, invalidation and downgrade request? Are you storing the entire cache line data or is at the byte granularity? Uh, it's per cache line. Sir. Okay. 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 Move on. Uh, so, the demonstration uh, was given for two colors, but this can be done for any colors. Uh, so we can use n bits, uh, such that we uh, we can have two power n minus one epochs. Uh, there is one alternative method. Uh, so we can just have two colors, uh, where red represents that a, a particular line may, may be in SPC, and black represents that. It, it is definitely not an SBC. So, so when there is an invalidation, we convert uh, red color to black color. And when we add new entries, uh, we, we introduce it, we, uh, we add it as red color. So by this method, we can have an infinite number of colors. So whenever it's invalidated, it will become black and a new set of entries will become red and so on. So this keeps on repeating and hence we can use just two colors to, uh, to simulate infinite number of colors. Uh, so here are some uh, observations uh, after using these uh, optimizations. So we can see that after using uh, three colors, seven colors, and fifteen colors, and the uh, infinite colors method, which is also known as flash reset, uh, the number of evictions that flushes the entries from the SQBC has reduced drastically. Uh, so this long lines are for no colors, uh, and the shorter ones denote the uh, use of colors. So in between three, seven, and fifteen also. Three colors has a higher uh, has a bit higher eviction than the seven and fifteen. The seven fifteen and flash reset all, uh, give almost the same results. Uh, so here is the hit ratio uh, results on uh, all the all the uh, store queues over we discussed. So we can see that again uh, the seven color, fifteen color, and the flash reset methods perform as well as good as uh, the optimal SQSB. Uh, so now we come to the problem we had earlier. So we had to predict accurately uh, if we get a hit uh, in the store queue store buffer. So this is done using something called a memory dependence predictor. Uh, so the uh, paper mentions uh, uh, very briefly that they use something called uh, uh, store distances uh, to uh, evaluate in which in which level we get a hit into. So using that, uh, using that concept, they are evaluating uh, using that for the store queue store buffer in this paper. So uh, they also uh, here, here is the result for the hit ratio, uh, the accurate, uh, predictor uh, accuracy for the spec 2006 benchmarks. We can see that it's quite high for almost all of them. It's uh, over 90%. Um, so since the predictor is not 100% accurate, we can see that uh, the results for the uh, store queue store buffer hit ratio is reducing with the predictor. Although it's not uh, too less, it's a it's slightly lesser than the optimal value. So here are the energy savings. Uh, so compared to the current design, uh, we can see that the standard uh, store queue store buffer, which doesn't have a uh, L1 TLB probes, has a higher energy saving, and the optimal SQSB and uh, the infinite colors and three colors have a lot higher energy savings than the standard one. Uh, then we look at uh, some parallel workloads. So uh, since uh, so we are previously looking at spec 2006 benchmarks. So this is the parsec benchmark which has uh, parallel workloads. 
So for parallel workloads, the problem is that there are a lot more flushes because uh, now invalidations can come from uh, other codes as well. So in this case, the energy improvements and the IPC improvements are a bit less compared to the uh, uh, single core applications. Uh, so here are some IPC improvements. Uh, this is not much. It's just about, uh, it's, uh, on an average, it's about 1.52%. Uh, but still, uh, it's a quite an improvement over the current design. So to summarize all of this, uh, we look at the best case and the worst case scenarios. Uh, so there are two aspects that we need to look into. One is the read locality and the other one is predictor accuracy. Uh, so uh, read locality uh, refers to the read locality in the application that we are working in. And predictor accuracy refers to the memory dependence predictors accuracy. So if we if both are good, good enough, then we have an improvement in energy and performance. If one of them is not good enough, then we go back, then uh, the results are similar to the current design and we don't get any improvement at all. But the worst case, uh, worst case comes when there is no read locality and the predictor is also performing very bad. This leads to false positives. So the predictor says that you will get a hit, but you won't get. So you'll have to probe the SQSB and then go on to probe the L1 TLB. So this will reduce the performance a lot more than the current design. So, so this is the worst case for this uh, design, uh, for this, uh, for the uh, method they are proposing in the paper. And uh, so two further points to discuss, maybe, uh, so the paper uses something called TSO, which is total store order uh, memory model. Yeah, so maybe let's, let's take some questions and then we can jump to uh, these points. Yes. Because folks are leaving. It's already yes. five or four. <clears throat> yeah, I had to, when you are uh, in slide uh, uh, 21, uh, when you're removing, let's say, SB red block. Yeah. So is it like a inclusion block? Let's say some data is in SB cache regarding to this block or the SB ca SBC caches are ex exclusive to the SB, um, the date, uh, whatever data is there. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. Uh, yeah, my first question is like, uh, are these SB caches uh, 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 like a inclusive or of L1 L2 layering or like they are ex uh, excluding exclusive caches compared to the SB? Like some data is in SB, is also in SB cache or like a particular okay. SB cache? Uh, so uh, data is in SB. Uh, so from SB, uh, after it is written back to the L1, it's, it moves to the SBC. So whatever is in SBC has already been written back to the L1. So in okay. that sense, you can say it is inclusive. Okay, so when you are uh, removing, let's say, this red block, so from cache also it might be removing or not? That particular data? removing only from cache. We are removing it only in the SBC, the store buffer. When you remove it from the store buffer, you move it to the store buffer cache. Instead of just deleting the entry, we move it to store buffer cache. In this uh, picture, so the blue color represents store buffer. So uh, once we write it to the cache, mm -hmm. so this this becomes a part of the store buffer cache, which which is shown in red color. Yeah. So okay. so this no longer belongs to store buffer. Okay, so let's say you get invalidated in the uh, L1 cache, so you remove it from store buffer as well as the SBC. Or just from the SB? No, it's on, so it's only from SBC. To the store buffer cache, right? So okay. once you have written to L1, it's not in SB. It's moved to SBC. Okay, okay, got it. So you don't need to remove. The, so there is, uh, it's not even present in SB. So there is no need for removing it. Uh, Prajit, I also have a query. You said that you are trying to reduce the number of TLB accesses and number of L1 accesses by using the store buffer store queue for accessing, right? Yeah. But unfortunately, you also say that you uh, to handle synonyms, you store both physical address and virtual address at the store buffer. Yeah. So from where do you get hold of the physical address? How do you populate the physical address in the store buffer? You because first you don't, uh, oh, you don't get the, the physical first. address before translation, right? Um, we don't save the L1 TLB access in the process of storing it. From now on, whenever any load comes in the future, you don't need to check uh, the load in L1 cache. If you just you already are probing whether it's there within store buffer, right? In no, order to make sure that... to, to handle synonyms, you you say that you are uh, storing both the physical address and virtual address in the store buffer. We are storing it in the process of writing it to L1 cache. We we'll need to write it to L1 cache in the store buffer, right? Okay. So during the time you will be having to, you have to probe the L1 and TLB once. After okay. that, in the future loads, you are preventing them from going to L1 and instead accessing from here. Okay, but then still while accessing the store buffer directly, you are just uh, comparing the virtual addresses. 
no we are comparing the phys- uh, okay right mm. so when you are already you are, when you are going to compare the virtual address as well as the physical address mm-hmm. then why, what are you saving by not translating right unless it's a purely physical comparison then we will not have any savings because i personally believe once you add certain structures to handle certain corner cases and un- uh, for unfortunately we will make use of all these structures for every case <laughs> so then what are we ending up saving is something i want to understand because one of the marketing points of this paper is you are saving number of accesses to tlb and l1 so that you can save the energy and all those stuff but here yeah probably intuitively i am not getting that feel maybe i am wrong you can correct me but yes Yeah, I think even they don't have a clear picture. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. No, I I would actually like to know about this. Uh, if you can actually understand it better, we can have an offline discussion. Discussion also, no issues. But yeah, sure. maybe, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, the number is going down uh, drastically. <laughs> any other questions okay prajit you want to talk about these two points or uh, uh so uh, yeah i'll just mention them uh, for people who are interested in the news so uh, in the whole paper we discuss something called the total store order memory model so uh, we can also discuss the coherence issues that might arise in uh, weaker memory or models uh, that don't even guarantee uh, uh, the order in a single threaded program uh, and also in the paper there is very little information about memory dependence predictors and they also claim that it already exists in the current hardware and uh, so implementations so uh, i just want to know if that is uh, true or not so these are the points that i would like to discuss okay yeah memory dependence predictors they exist but you won't get any information in the public domain okay yeah we actually searched for it but uh, we couldn't get any like there the paper is there but we couldn't uh, ensure that there is an implementation in the uh, you know the products that come out so that's why we are confused about maybe ping me i will tell you where exactly it's implemented but i can't tell you the recording is on so it's not there in our uh, oh anyway so <laughs> yeah okay so so let's wrap it up uh, we are already uh, crossing the time right okay uh, yes. devas is you need to stop the recording